reading of God's word, I invite you to do so. Mark 12, verses 18 through 27. It uh, is on page 848. 848 in your pew Bibles. Uh, and while I'm thinking about this, uh, for the deacons, uh, just FYI, I unlocked this door over here this morning thinking that we may have had some visitors that wanted to come in this way, but I will forget to lock it back. So if you'll help me remember. All right, this is the word of the Lord. Mark 12, 18 through 27. And Sadducees came to him who say, that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third, likewise, and the seventh left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For seven had had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Amen, amen. You are quite wrong. Amen, amen. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but this the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that we would be not merely listeners of the word of God, not mere, merely readers of the word of God, not merely those who have knowledge of the word of God, but those who are changed and transformed by the word of God, that we might be doers of the word of God and that we might know, that we might know you and that we might know your power. So be with us, attend to us. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Our passage today, of course, we've been looking at Mark for uh, a number of months. And Jesus is now in the temple, and he is beginning to answer all kinds of questions. And I don't know about you, but if you do, if you interact with people on a spiritual level, if you do evangelism, if you uh, talk to Christian people or non-Christian people, or if you've been to university and you've taken a philosophy class or, or this or that, Oftentimes, people will ask questions uh, about the Bible or about God or about Jesus or about your faith or, or those types of things. Some people actually want to know the answer. Those are sweet conversations in which people are inquisitive. They've been brought to this place uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they have a very keen interest in who God is and how can they be made, made right with him or I don't understand this passage. Would you help me understand uh, what this means? I can't make sense of it. Uh, and sometimes people will ask questions that they actually don't want to know the answer to. They're just trying to use questions to stump you and make you look like a fool or mock you or mock God. Or some people are so brash and bold these days they want to make fun of Jesus and those types of things. And one of the questions that people will say, if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and can do anything, can he create a boulder so heavy that he can't lift it? And... That just exposes the question asker as a fool 
to be honest with you. Uh, but people ask those kinds of questions. They try to create uh, you know, false dichotomies that just normal, common, everyday, ordinary Christian people don't have the answers to. And so we looked last week where Jesus, uh, if he chooses to, he can answer these questions very easily. It's no, no big deal for the omniscient, all-knowing, all-wise God to say just one sentence and dismiss the whole argument uh, with uh, great clarity. Um, and so today in our text, we've got some Sadducees that are coming, and they're also going to be asking questions, just like the Pharisees did that we looked at last week. Uh, now the Sadducees are coming today. To put it in the context, it's still Tuesday. It's still Tuesday. Uh, earlier in the week, Jesus had cleansed the temple. He uh, had been teaching in Solomon's portico. It's during the Passover. There's thousands and thousands of people there. The temple is hustling and bustling. It is a big business Opportunity. There are people from all over the place that are there to worship, to pray, to offer sacrifice, uh, to celebrate uh, with God's people. And Jesus is in the midst of that. Uh, and yet he knows that his time is at hand. And so he is there in the midst. But his opposers, those in opposition against him... Uh, being stirred up by the devil, being stirred up by sin in their own hearts, are now on the attack. Uh, and Jesus has drawn attention with the cleansing of the temple to himself from these religious leaders and their governing authorities. The only thing that particularly the Sadducees don't participate in is any kind of military opposition against the Romans. And so they had great favor with Rome. They had great favor with the administrators and uh, uh, those in charge because they just, uh, they just ab uh, abided by whatever Rome wanted uh, them to do militarily. And then Rome protected this big business that they had, which was the Temple Mount. And so now the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus had rebuffed. And now we see later in the day, in the afternoon, now the Sadducees come. And they ask, they ask questions in a mocking fashion. It's not necessarily clear in the English text, but I'll try to flesh that out, verses 18 through 23. And Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying... Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, no, he left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and the seventh left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also Died In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. So the first thing I want to flesh out a little bit is, who are these people? Like we hear these words, Pharisees, Herodians, Sadducees, chief priests, teachers of the law, all these types of people. But who are the Sadducees? So they differed greatly from the Pharisees. In fact, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were in opposition against one another. As surely as the Pharisees and the Herodians last week were in opposition, so the Sadducees and the Pharisees uh, differed greatly in terms of their theology and the application and implications of God's word and what they considered to be the Bible. And so the S Sadducees were those people who were part of the uh, high priestly family, those types of things. The high priest would be chosen out of the Sadducees, very important, prominent priestly people. They were a part of the Sanhedrin, which is the, uh, the 70 people that controlled God's, um, 
uh, controlled the Jews, and they actually had the controlling interest within the Sanhedrin. So they had like a super majority. So whatever they wanted to have happen is what happened, particularly with the temple, particularly with the temple. And the temple, I remind you, was big business. It wasn't just a place where people went and worshiped. That's what Jesus, that's why he cleansed the temple. Uh, temple. He was like, this, this temple, this house is to be a house of prayer. There is sacrifices going on. This is to, to be the place in all the world at that moment where God and his people could meet through um, the ceremonial law and, and, the, and the, uh, the ways in which God said, this is the way that I want you to approach me. And so the Sadducees had charge over that. But rather than make it as easy as possible for God's people to worship, they made it extremely difficult. They tried to follow the letter of the law, but use it to exploit the people of God. And so what do I mean by that? Well, it's Passover. People had been traveling from all over. They would not bring their sacrificial animals with them unless they were close. And so they would show up at the temple wanting to make sacrifice, but they needed to purchase an animal. And so first, the Sadducees that set up this system were like, oh, what kind of money do you have? Oh, you can't use that money here. You've got to change that into the money that we use here. And we'll, we're happy to do that. There's the money changers. If, if, you'll, if you'll give them $10 in your money, we'll give you five back in the temple money. So they extorted the people financially just to make a profit, just to make a profit. Maybe you brought an animal in for sacrifice. And so they would have the priest look it over and say, oh, you know what? They're, this one's got a spot on it. And if you see right here in God's word, you can't, you can't sacrifice um, this, this lamb with a spot on it. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take that off your hands and you're going to buy this one. So we'll have a trade in, but you're going to have to pay a little fee. So here's one that's uh, got no blemish on it. Go and go and offer this one to the Lord. And the people would say, oh, thank you so much. You know, I'm here to honor the Lord. I'm here to serve the Lord. I want to do things according to the word of God. And so they would go away. And the next person would come up. They would still have the blemished lamb and somebody would come up with their lamb and say, oh, your, lamb, your lamb's got a blemish. But this lamb right here is unblemished. And so you need to offer this one, not the one you brought. But we're going to have to charge you a little bit for that. And it was just this perpetual extortion of God's people. And now you can understand why the Son of God coming into the temple wanted to just rid all the deceit uh, and lies from the temple of the Lord. And the Sadducees had done that intentionally and purposefully in order to gain power, prestige, and wealth. And so archaeologists have, uh, as they've kind of uh, done their digs and those types of things, they've just, uh, of course, dug up places where prominent Sadducees lived and their homes were very opulent according to the day. And so this was a wealthy, aristocratic group of people who had great power and authority, particularly in the Temple Mount. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible as authoritative. The first five books of Moses. They did not believe in the Pharisaical traditions and thus are at odds with the Pharisees on almost everything. Almost everything. They don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, which it says here in verse 18. And it's funny that in verse 23 they ask a question about what's going on in the resurrection, which tells you they don't really care. They don't even believe it. So what else is going on? We'll get to that in a minute. They don't believe in the resurrection, so they're secularists. They just believe in the here and now. Get all you can, because when you're dead, you're dead. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in demons. They don't believe in heaven. 
They don't believe in hell. They deny the supernatural. Know anybody like that today in America? <laughs> Sounds like a lot of university professors. Lots of power uh, and just living for the moment. They believed in unrestrained free will to the degree that they're like deists. I don't know if you know what a deist is. A deist says, oh, yeah, God created all things. He made it, and then he just went away. He, he, left, he left the building. He's like the great Elvis of the sky. He put on a show, and now he's not here anymore, and so he's just left it up to you. He's wound that clock, and now it's up to you. Uh, he's just uninvolved in daily affairs. Many of the early, church, uh, uh, the early uh, American fathers were deists. Um, they, uh, that's just where they were. They, just, they believed in moral standards and those types of things based on an infinite, eternal, unchanging God, but God wasn't around. Um, and so then there, the Sadducees would say, well, things like prayer are irrelevant. Now, can you imagine being in charge of the temple? And Jesus is saying this is a, to be a house of prayer for all the nations. And the people in charge of the temple do not believe that prayer has any power or authority other than to make you feel fine right now. It's just about you. Nobody's listening is what they would say. So it was just a psychological thing. And so now you see, now you see who it is that Jesus is dealing with in the Temple Mount on this Tuesday during Passover, and they've come. And they've found him out. They've sought him out. Because the day before, he had chased everybody away that was doing their lucrative business. And they're going to get to the bottom of it. And not just they're going to investigate Jesus, they also, they also are going to try to kill two birds with one stone. And they actually want to mock the Pharisees who believe in the resurrection. So there is a, a two-pronged attack here. One making fun of Jesus with this question and the other making fun of the Pharisees who did hold to the resurrection. They're just mocking anybody who has an eternal view of life and the world. I want you to notice that from our passage, they're actually quote from the Bible. They, they know the scripture, they can quote, they've memorized, they've studied. These are very, very learned people, but they use the Bible for their own benefit. And here they come. And so they ask questions in mockery, and now Jesus answers questions with scripture. Verses 24 to 27. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. And so what the Sadducees had done is they came up with this elaborate story based on the Leverite marriage from the Old Testament, from uh, the law of Moses, in which a man, if he died before he had a son, if he had a brother, he was to be a kinsman redeemer, like Boaz, and he was to have a child with his brother's wife to perpetuate his dead, deceased brother's name. So his brother, who has uh, died, now has an heir. And then the second brother is to raise that child on behalf of his deceased brother. And so the Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, in order to mock resurrection, make up this crazy story in which they try to confuse people. Like, well, yeah, well, like, who's, whose wife is that going to be? So what they were doing is making fun, truly, of people's belief in an afterlife. 
They wanted to just debunk the afterlife altogether. And so they make up a story and say, look, you people who think there's an afterlife, look at this story that we just made up. You have got to be a fool to think there's anything such. Look at the quandary and the quagmire you get into by believing in an afterlife. Who, whose wife, this is a simple story, whose wife is this going to be? She's had seven husbands. And so they're not really worried about who's, uh, who's going to have the bride. They just are saying resurrection is foolish. And so Jesus, you're a fool for bringing, uh, be, believing in the afterlife. And the Pharisees are also fools for believing in an afterlife. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a straw man that they develop in order to make fun of other religious people, and they don't actually even care about the answer. They're just making fun of people who hold uh, religious truths uh, close to their heart. And so as they approach Jesus, that's the question, right? They don't care about the answer. They're just trying to make uh, fun of of Jesus and the Pharisees. And so Jesus says to them, is this not the reason you're wrong? So immediately, immediately, just blunt, uh, you got it wrong. And in fact, the word here is, is you're led astray. You're going in the wrong direction. Like the question that you've asked, you, you're, just, you're just going off uh, the deep end. You've fallen off the ditch on this side. The road, the pathway's going this way, and you just, you just wrecked your car in the ditch. You run into a tree, right? The idea uh, is also used, this led astray, is about the sheep that uh, is lost. And the shepherd has to go find the sheep that's gone astray. And so Jesus is likening the Pharisees to lost sheep wandering around out in the woods, subject to all kinds of harm and evil. Unless they are rescued and redeemed and brought back into the fold. And this is what he says. This is why you've gone astray. This is why you're wrong. This is why you err in telling that story from the motive that you tell it from. Number one, you don't know your Bible. You don't know the word of God. You don't know the scripture. These are the religious leaders of the temple. This is Jesus saying to Nicodemus, you're blind. <laughs> you have no idea what is going on. Right? And so he, Jesus begins to say, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. He shows that they commit this great error and fabricate this great story because they actually don't know their own Bible, the thing that they're claiming as their authority to do all the things that they do, to regulate all the business of the temple. And Jesus is saying, you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Now, did they... Would they then come back and say, actually, we do know the Bible because we just quote it from the Bible? Could they say that? And the answer is absolutely. Guess who else quoted scripture to Jesus? Satan did. He knew his Bible, right? He knew his Bible. You will talk to all kinds of people in your life that have Bible verses memorized for particular use and need. So Jesus is not telling the Sadducees that they have absolutely no knowledge of the Bible or that they can't memorize a verse and quote a verse. What he's saying is that they don't know the sense and meaning of the Bible. They're not putting it to the right use. They don't know how to handle the word of God. They don't know how to rightly divide the word of God in a way that you come to understand and grow wise from the intended use of God's word in your life. So some people put up these false constructions or ideas about the Bible. I don't know 
This is a huge cultural issue right now uh, with all the gender things that are going on and people quote stuff from uh, the Old Testament and they'll get into these things like, oh, well, do you really believe you can't wear clothes that are made out of two different kinds of fabric? And it's like, <laughs> you know, I <laughs> just throwing up questions and oppositions that actually have nothing to do with the actual uh, um, issue at hand and that's what the Sadducees were doing they just had all kinds of scripture memorized they were these proof texts that they would use in order to support their own opinion about matters and it didn't matter if those verses were uh, uh, out of context necessarily or held in um, conjunction with the rest of the scripture. And so that's why it's important for us as Christian people to know the whole word of God and to understand how it works together to bring forth truth and understanding and an accurate knowledge to lead us in a way in which we understand who God truly is what he approves of, what he disapproves of, what is righteous, what is unrighteous. You've got people trying to use the Bible right now, and I'm not just talking about individual people. I'm talking about pastors and seminaries and denominations that want to use this word to promote sin and sinful behavior. And they'll say things like, God is love. Well, he is, and what does that mean, and what implications does that have in terms of godliness and righteousness? Does God also hate sin? Will he judge sin? How do you escape his judgment if you're a sinner and you've been cut off from him in your sin? And so it's important to understand how to use the word of God or its intended meaning. Number one, to come to know Jesus Christ. Jesus said of himself, all of these things were written about me. Right? He took them to the law, to the prophets, uh, uh, as he uh, was walking on the road to Emmaus. He instructed his disciples, when you're reading this Bible, it's going to have something to do with me. It's going to have something to do with me. And so the Sadducees didn't even care about that. They just had their little proof text, and Jesus calls them on the carpet. You don't even know and understand, or, or you're not able to teach or instruct in the Scripture at all. And you also don't know the power of God. Why did the Sadducees not believe in the afterlife? They didn't believe in the power of God. How is God going to take a dead body and reconstitute it? How is he going to take the soul from that body, which they also didn't necessarily believe in after death? How is he going to keep up with all of that stuff? And Jesus is saying, as surely as God cre could create all things out of nothing, ex nihilo, he can also keep and guard and protect Amen. individual human beings by his power and his authority. As surely as he could create a man, body and soul from the dust of the earth, so surely he could maintain or retain mankind after death. Both creation and resurrection are equally easy for Almighty God. And the Sadducees had no personal relationship with this God at all. So Jesus shows why it is that they have committed this glaring error in their question, to even ask such a question. Then he goes on, he demolishes their false assumption that marriage continues after the resurrection. Now this one, I'm going to be honest with you, this one people struggle with. Uh, people, particularly people who've been married for a long time, you hear this a lot, and um, 
you know, there's a time and a place to talk to people about what's going to happen in their future life, and this is the day, this is the day where I get to correct our faulty view of who you're going to be married to after you go into eternity, all right? And so in this story, the Sadducees are like, well, you know, who's it going to be? Is it going to be husband one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Which one? And Jesus says... None. None. We're not going to be married to our human spouse in the afterlife. That's, that's a sadness for a lot of people uh, who really love and care for their spouses. And it's, um, that's, just, that's just Jesus' teaching on that matter. And so what uh, I would think the Lord would tell you to do is care for your spouse with all your might in the here and now. Because in the future life, they're not going to be your husband or your wife. They're going to be your brother or your sister. So they'll be there. You'll have love and care and attention for these people, but you will not be married to those people because who is the church going to be married to? To Christ. And therefore, you have this beautiful picture. Like Our marriages here are a picture or a representation or a gospel proclamation of a future marriage that we're looking forward to in which we have the penultimate husband and his bride has been cleansed from every spot in sin. So Jesus says, the straw man that you've built to mock me and to mock the Pharisees um, is baseless. Where has Jesus come from? Uh, so we would say, oh, well, didn't, no, see, he, he came down from Galilee. Where did, he, where, where did he come from? Out of what knowledge? Out of what insight? What had his eyes seen long before his incarnation? And he had seen, and it was clear to him, what heaven was going to be like. And now he is instructing the people, this is really what the afterlife will be like. There will be no human necessity to propagate the species in the afterlife. And therefore, there is no reason for marriage. You're going to be like the angels. You're going to be given a body that can go the distance. You'll be uh, preserved and maintained uh, in, in all of your humanity. But there will not be husbands and wives. We will be like the angels of heaven. So he dismisses the Sadducees and their question because they don't know the scriptures or the power of God. He dismisses their question as just irrelevant because it's not even factual because there will be no marriage in heaven. Uh, and then three, he proves the doctrine of the resurrection from scripture. Verse 26, he says, and as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses? So what Jesus does in that moment is these people come and they've tried to ask this question. They try to make Jesus look like a fool. And they've asked this real serious question. And probably people standing in the, in the temple were stumped like, oh, my goodness, that's a great question. I don't know. what, Like, you know, what's going to happen? And Jesus just takes his finger and he pokes it in the Sadducee's eye. And it's a, <laughs> because he begins to use, he begins to use the, the books of the Bible that the Sadducees held as authoritative and he takes them to scriptures to say, you've got this all wrong. Have, have you not read in your Bible what it says about resurrection? Have you, have you not looked at that place where the great prophet Moses, who you esteem so highly, meets with God in Exodus 3 at the burning bush, this, this tremendous, powerful uh, uh, time of, of God meeting with Moses to redeem the people out of Egypt. And he says, do you, not, do, do you know this story? Have you, have you read this story? Uh, so he begins to make fun of them and their so-called lofty argument, and he begins to break it apart with the word of God. 
When God met with your prophet Moses in the authoritative section of your Bible, do you remember these words? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now you can imagine those men moving from we're going to make fun of Jesus to being extremely embarrassed and therefore extremely angry. Extremely angry. Because what Jesus is pointing out to them is that their doctrine or lack of a doctrine of resurrection is unscriptural. It's very clear in the Bible that God holds and sustains his people in life forever. God is a God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. God lives in an ever-present now, and those who depart and are with God are in his presence forever and ever and ever. And in the resurrection, they will be granted a new body, according to 1 Corinthians 15, but their soul, everything that makes you, you, when you depart uh, in death and you stand uh, uh, in the presence of the Lord, the, the thing that makes you, you, will be alive and well. You will never have experienced life like you have in that moment. And you will long for, like Paul did in 2 Corinthians, you will long for... Uh, uh, to have another body, but you will be as alive as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Amen. are. Amen. And so Jesus proves the resurrection from Scripture in the section of Scripture that the Sadducees held as their authority. And then Jesus draws it to a close, which I will as well, with the only possible conclusion. Whose Going to be the husband. <laughs> Which one? One to seven. And Jesus just draws it to a conclusion and says, you are quite wrong. Your whole question, your whole motive, your whole understanding, your whole spiritual and religious system is bogus because you don't know God nor his power. You don't know your Bible. And you're not just astray, but you are way, way off. It's not just they've gone a little way off the path. They can't even see the path anymore. That's the language that Jesus is using. You are quite wrong. You're badly mistaken. You're grossly wrong about your understanding and the things that you believe and that you teach. It's very clear from this passage that Jesus does not hold the Sadducees very high in terms of their understanding of the Bible or of their use of the temple or their ability to lead God's people as a group, or even to be able to choose a high priest that will represent them well. So what are some applications here? This is a lot of history, I know. What are some applications? Application number one, people who rule over God's people spiritually or in worship, or teach the Bible, must know his word. Must be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Must know God personally. Church history is full of teachers and leaders who had no relationship with Jesus Christ at all. If you look at just even the, the history of the Pope, it's full of people just like the Sadducees. Had no interest in God, the Lord, Jesus. 
the scripture, just power, wealth, authority, self-justification, those types of things. But people who lead God's people must know how to preach and teach his word correctly. And then two questions concerning God's word. So maybe you've got questions, right? It's, that's great. Like, ask questions. Um, there's nothing wrong with questions. Some people say, well, there's nothing. Uh, there is no bad question, right? You've heard that said. And I, I would say that Jesus would disagree with that. Uh, there are bad questions, uh, faulty questions, erroneous questions, mocking questions. Uh, so as you ask questions about the Lord and about his word, ask them from a place of humility and teachability. Ask questions, but with a proper motive and a proper desire. You could have asked this same question of Jesus and it would have meant something completely different if you really wanted to know the answer to the question. And I have a feeling Jesus would have responded in a completely different way. But he is able to see the motive and the desire behind the question. And then I would say as we study God's word, And as we ask questions about the Bible and its veracity, its truthfulness, uh, there there are easy parts of the Bible and there are very, very difficult parts of the Bible. But as we're studying the word of God, what is it that you actually want? What do you actually want? What do you want to do with the knowledge that you've gained? Some people want to gain knowledge about the Bible so they can look important or win arguments or argue with people. Some people want to uh, use the Bible and learn little nuggets of verses so that they can try to confound Christian people or make fun of them. I don't know. But as you learn the scripture, and as you study, and as you read, and as you gain knowledge, God wants you to move closer to Jesus Christ with that knowledge. That's actually the ultimate issue. Do you know Jesus in a deeper, more affectional way, having studied this passage? Is Jesus more real to you? Is your sin uh, uh, more uh, vile to you? Do you find the glory of Christ more exciting or, or more motivating? Or do you feel convicted that you don't love Christ like he is worthy to be loved? Those types of things, it is going to be a relational dynamic. Susie and I had a friend, uh, well, friend, uh, uh, seminary professor, Old Testament professor, when we were in, in Jackson, uh, John Currid. Of course, very learned man. He went to the University of Chicago, which is a, an extremely elite school, uh, to get his PhD. So it wasn't like he just went there. I mean, he was like on the highest level of education uh, in the United States. So it was almost like You know, it's MIT, not for engineering, but MIT for uh, archaeology and uh, biblical languages and those types of things. So he really, really was a very smart man. And he was studying his Hebrew Bible one day. And he said he had papers out on the desk. And he had been working through parsing different uh, verbs and working through the passage and making all the connections and, uh, you know, doing like a sentence structures and all those types of things. And the Hebrew is very uh, uh, detailed when you begin to understand how it's put together. And so he had been working for about half the day and his wife came into the kitchen and said, hey, baby, uh, what, what, do you, uh, what are you studying? What, what scripture are you studying? And he was like, I don't know. I don't know. And so he was handling the word of God 
like it was an academic study. Didn't know what passage he was looking at. Had never gotten to Christ in the passage. It was just all for his brain to be proud and to make an A on a test and be able to defend his dissertation or whatever it was. And he said, I told my wife that day, I don't ever want to take up the word of God so glibly like that anymore. I want to do my study. I want to do my research, but I have got to meet with God in his word. And he said, I need to be very, very careful with that. And so as you do your devotions, as you read your Bible, as you're doing your studies, ask God to meet with you in his word and ask him to show you Jesus. And so what was Jesus trusting in in that moment, the last week before the crucifixion that he could refute questions? He was trusting in the scripture and in the power of God because he had not been led astray. So the Sadducees were quite, quite wrong <laughs> and Jesus is quite right. Amen. You can trust him in all matters of faith and practice. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, oh my goodness, these, we see ourselves in some of these groups of people, self-justification, trying to look good, uh, trying to appear smart, trying to stay in control. Um, and we often mishandle your word. We may be uh, in, entrenched in a, per, a particular belief system about a particular subject. And we've got proof texts to defend our position. But I pray that it's those uh, proof texts in that position are godly and right um, rather than like the Sadducees who don't really care. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to move us along in our maturity and in our spiritual refinement. Make us more and more into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I know that's going to mean that we're going to be more and more humble and that we'll trust ourselves less and less and we'll look to you and to your word to uphold us, to sustain us, um, to renew our minds that we might know what is good and right and fitting for your people. And as we live for you, may you get the glory for the transformation that others may see in us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.